Well, good morning, Six Points Church. I'm happy to see you, most of you. I know that some of you are still at home. So for those of you at home, maybe just like text me a picture of yourself or something. I'll look at it later. I'll be like, ah, I know that person. Um, my name is Andrew Kola. I'm the assistant pastor here at Six Points Church, and I'm happy that I get to be introducing a brand new sermon series to you guys today called The Seven. Should be a nice big picture of it. Thank you, Scott, for that graphic. He always makes the graphics, by the way, and he sends them to me, and I just plug them in. So if you ever think that one of those graphics is cool, do not give me credit for them. They go to Scott. So um, we are going to be talking about the seven churches addressed in the book of Revelation, the churches of Asia Minor to whom John writes uh, in the book of Revelation. Now, the reason we're doing this, and I'll explore a little bit more of this reason later on in the sermon, but we're doing this so that we as a, a church, Six Points Church specifically, a local church, can look at and hopefully learn from some of the successes of those seven churches and avoid some of the failures of those seven churches. That's the goal here. We're going to kind of do a little bit of a comparison I'm not going to do just a straight application. We are going to talk about context and the significance of the historical importance happening during that time and what it means. But we're also going to look at how we stack up next to these churches and see what we need to work on and what we're doing really, really well. So first off, before we dive right in, let's do a little bit of groundwork. Let's set up the context. Um, let's talk about the author, the author of the book of Revelation. Um, many historians and theologians alike believe that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelations. I also believe that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelations for several reasons. Um, uh, and th by the way, the same John that wrote the fourth gospel and the books of first, second, and third John. That John. Um, and this is why I believe that. Number one, the author straight up refers to himself as John. Okay? That's reason number one. So we already know first name, John, got it. That kind of eliminates everyone else that isn't named John. Uh, reason number two, this author has a personal relationship with the seven churches of Asia Minor. Um, we see that in chapter 1 and in chapter 11, he makes reference to that. We also know that the Apostle John had reference and um, relation to those seven churches. Number three, uh, his circumstances, the author's circumstances at the time of writing this. Um, for those of you who don't know, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, those circumstances matched those of John the Apostle, who was placed in Asia Minor um, around 70 to 100 AD by numerous reliable historic sources from the second century. And then fourthly, the book of Revelation is just absolutely filled and saturated with Old Testament um, symbolism, imagery, and echoes. And that probably implies that a Jewish writer was, you know, like John, who was a Jewish writer, was operating in an overwhelmingly Gentile population. And we know that that area was, which we would call modern day Turkey, right? So that area of those seven churches, um, we would call modern day Turkey. That is um, overwhelmingly pagan, right? They were a Gentile uh, culture. So that's a little bit about the author, why I believe that the author was John the Apostle. Many historians support that claim. Next, I want to take a look at the historical context of the book itself. It is largely believed that this book would have been written sometime between the late 60s and the mid-90s. I personally hold the belief um, that, as well as many other scholars, that it was written closer to the mid-90s, close to 95 AD um, in the first century. Uh, this would mean that Emperor Nero's reign over Rome had concluded, and the new emperor of Rome was a man named Domitian. And he was also ruthless, a lot of ruthless um, Roman emperors during that time. This also supports the historical claims that it was Emperor Domitian himself who had banished John to the island of Patmos for committing a crime. Does anybody know what that crime was? It was the gospel. It was preaching the truth of God's word. And that was illegal in that time, which then also helps with a little bit more historical context. You see, during this time in the late first century in Rome, if you were a Christian 
and you went out to preach the gospel, you were kind of painting a big old target on your back. In America today, we, we do face persecution for our faith, right? If I were to go out publicly and declare all of my beliefs according to Scripture and that I back up what Scripture says and that I believe in Jesus, that he is the resurrected Son of God, I would get some flack, right? There would be people on Twitter or Facebook that would come at me and maybe cuss at me and say some mean things. But at the end of the day, I am not in imminent danger for my faith here in America. No one's going to hurt me for being a Christian. Maybe my feelings a little bit, but no one's going to actually physically harm me. That was not the case for John during this time. Christians could die for preaching the truth of God's word. They're, they were putting their lives on the line. We see it happen to Paul a ton in the book of Acts. He's constantly in prison. He's constantly being persecuted and chased around uh, this area because of his faith. And the same happens to John. So that kind of helps us understand the mindset that John has as he's writing this book down. He understands that this could mean his death. So, um, that is just a little bit about the m culture of that time, about the historical context. Uh, and I, I'm putting it politely, just so you know. Um, Roman oppression was brutally ugly. I won't go into the details. If you want, you can look it up later. Um, it was very gruesome. It, it makes modern death look like nothing, okay? It was ugly. Next the structure and purpose of the book. This structure fairly is easy to identify, um, being as it is deliberately handed to us in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 19 says this, Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. And there we have three distinct sections of the book of Revelation. If you wanted to, you could also categorize them as small, medium, and large, because that is how big they are in uh, comparison to one another. The what you have seen is relatively little. What is now is a medium-sized section. And what will come later takes up about 80% of the whole book. So, what you have seen. This is that first section of the book of Revelation. This is Jesus commanding that John write about the things that he saw in the vision that he had just been given. You see, John has a series of visions while on the island of Patmos. And the first vision we're going to read here in chapter 1, starting in verse 12 of the book of Revelation. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was, like, was white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. So, that is a vivid image of whom? Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Scott, the pastor of this church, for answering that question. I was kind of hoping someone else could answer it, but, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> you know how, like, in Sunday school, and the, the, the one kid who definitely knows his Bible's like, mm, Jesus. <laughs> so, that is the, what you have seen. Jesus is appearing to John in a vision, and he tells John something. This is the what is now. This is the commandment that is specifically to John to write down what he sees, to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now, the order in which these churches are listed is not an accident. Um, we have a map, actually, if you want to, if you want to look up. So there's a map. Oh, it's so hard to see. Is everyone? Did you bring your binoculars? Okay. Um, if you're online, you're probably going to have a better time seeing this. If you're here in person, just squint. Um, this route, starting with the Church of Ephesus, going up to Smyrna and Pergamum and uh, Thyatira, all the way around through Laodicea back to Ephesus was a very, very common postal route, 
Okay, this was traversed along by many people, not just believers, but lots of people. This was a heavy traffic area. And so the postal route went in that direction, and God gave the order uh, to write to these churches in that order intentionally. And I'm going to guess this was a commonly used tactic. If you wanted to write to one of the churches, you'd probably just have that letter circulate that postal route. So this is where we will be spending most of our time during this sermon series as a whole, is talking about these seven churches and the letters written to them. Um, <clears throat> our hope as we explore this sermon series together, as we dissect and unpack each of these letters, our hope is so that we as a church can learn from their successes and their failures. You see, we are also a church. Believe it or not, although the book of Revelation is heavily end times um, prophecy and apocalyptic literature, these were seven actual churches, and they had actual people in them, and they were in actual towns or cities. They were real, and these letters were real, and they actually went home and had families and lives, and, and just like you or I. So we know that this is a real contextual thing and so when we look at it, our understanding is that we are also a church, a real church filled with real people in a real town. Are we not? And so we want to be effective and efficient in the mission of the gospel of God's good truth. When you leave every Sunday morning and you walk through those two double doors in big letters across that top wall out as you leave, says what? Go and make disciples. That's the mission. Go and make disciples. Now that's very broad. There's a lot of detail work that takes place in that, but that's the mission, right? And we want to be effective at that mission. And in order to do so, we need to take a look at some of the very first churches who had the same exact mission. Now, of these churches, two of them get golden stars on their report card. Um, we see that <clears throat> Smyrna and Philadelphia both get a big old thumbs up. They're doing great, and they get um, adoration. They're like, yeah, good job, guys. You're doing great work. Scott will talk about those churches. I, unfortunately, won't be talking about those churches today. Five of the seven churches are kind of in hot water. I guess Laodicea is in lukewarm water. Thank you for the four of you who laughed at that joke. <laughs> again, Scott will talk more about it later. So, again, our purpose right now for this series is we want to understand why John wrote these letters to these churches. What can we learn from these letters written to these churches? Where are we succeeding? Where are we failing? How can we avoid failure in the future? If we can successfully identify some of our problem spots as a church and address them head on and fix them and repent from those sinful issues that we as a church have, then our effectiveness is going to skyrocket. And hopefully we'll end up looking more like the churches of Philadelphia or uh, Smyrna. Alrighty. So then... The final part of Revelation, and this is the part we won't be talking a whole lot about during the series, is the bulk of the book, what will take place later. And John receives another vision after this. It is a much larger vision. Um, almost all of the remaining chapters of Revelation are prophetic in nature. Um, we call them end time prophecy or apocalyptic literature, or if you want to sound like a Bible nerd, you can call it eschatology. Um, I like the word eschatology. I like ology words. I don't know, it just makes me feel smart. <clears throat> so, due in part to the fact that much of the interpretation of Revelation is controversial across all churches globally, and also I didn't prepare it, we won't be talking about them today. I did prepare to talk about the letters to Ephesus. So we're going to talk about the letter to Ephesus. We're not going to talk about end-time prophecy. Perhaps another time, but not during this series. So if this is what you were hoping for, I am sorry. <clears throat> so, with all that in mind, we have covered a lot of context. We've kind of laid the groundwork for the book of Revelation, the author, um, the time period, 
what's happening during that time period, the purpose and the structure of the book. We've had a nice healthy outline. I think it's time to dive in. So starting in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, this is what we are going to read. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Let me pause. Who is that again? Not Scott? Jesus. Thank you. Good. Jesus. We're on the same page. Okay, Scott, you're allowed to answer now. Verse 2. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So far, it was looking like a really good church. If this was the description of a church in your town, I would recommend you attend that church. However, the description is not yet concluded. In verse 4, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It may not seem like there was a whole lot there on the surface level. It looks like a common evaluation that you'd get from your boss at work, right? All right, yeah, look, uh, you're doing this really well. Yeah, you're doing this really well. Uh, you need to work on this. You need to work on that. Overall, pretty good job. Just tr a few trouble spots, right? Have you ever had an, a meeting like that with a supervisor who basically went over what you're doing well and what you're not doing well? That's kind of what the Church of Ephesus is getting from uh, John right here. Yeah, here's what you're doing really well. Here's where you're struggling. And yeah, you, also this is what's something you're doing well. We're going to unpack that. We're going to take a look at why some of the things they were doing well were celebrated and why uh, they, that one thing, losing their first love, is a really, really bad thing to do. So we're going to dive into that. First of all, in case you were wondering, this is also the same church in Ephesus to whom Paul writes in the book of Ephesians. Same church. This is also very likely the church that was started by Aquila and Priscilla in the book of Acts, chapter 18. Since the church's foundation, it has had an absolute A-list, top-tier, monster dream team group of leaders and pastors throughout its history. First of all, Aquila and Priscilla, pretty good leaders. Paul himself during his third missionary journey, spent time in Ephesus. And uh, we consider him to be a great contributor to much of the New Testament. And to have Paul preach at a church, I'm sorry, Scott, if Paul was an option, I would take it. Just saying. I'm sure you would do the same. I'm sure you would. Um, also, Paul's disciple, Timothy. Paul trained lots and lots of pastors, Timothy being one of them. And Timothy taught at Ephesus for a while, and then eventually John himself, the apostle of Jesus, taught at Ephesus. So this has had a really, really rich history of just outstanding leaders come and preach the word of truth to these people. So they've got really, really good foundations. They have an excellent starting point. However, they have a downfall. But before we talk about that, let's talk about some of the victories of that church. Let's look at the things that they did right, the good. Number one, hard work. If you look back at verse 2, it says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I want to focus on that hard work. The people at the church of Ephesus worked hard. And they worked hard. How many of you would consider yourself hard workers? Oh, you're all so humble. I'll just raise my hand on your behalf. This is a hard working church. Okay? Can I get an amen? Amen. 
I can sense the hesitation in your voice. You all feel awkward about, I, I, should I not claim to be a hard worker? You are. I know. Trust me. I know. I've seen it. You want to know how I know? Because guys like Mark Doubles spend 20 plus hours a week at this church for free, making sure that the cameras and the sound system are working so that you can enjoy worship adequately. I know because people like Mary Stone do more physical labor than every boy in the youth group combined. I've seen it with my own eyes. That woman could lift a car. This is a hardworking church. We have event after event where countless of you show up and help out, but you're not there just to give half of your effort. When you're there, you're fully there, you're fully present, and you're working hard. I've seen it with my own eyes. I know for a fact this is a hardworking church. You don't have to worry about being lazy. You've got it in the back. Good job. Go ahead and give yourself a little pat on the back. Nice work. Ephesus was the same way. They were a hardworking church probably because of their outstanding leadership. They had tons of really hardworking leaders, pastors, people who knew the truth and wanted to instill that truth in them, and so they worked hard for it. Reason number two, perseverance. Perseverance is a big thing. As we mentioned earlier, the church was under a lot of persecution. A lot of persecution. There were people in the world who absolutely hated their message, and they were trying to kill them for it. But that did not stop the church of Ephesus. They kept meeting, they kept praising, and they kept sharing the truth of God's word. They were a church that persevered through hardship, through turmoil and tribulation. Next, they were a church with zero tolerance for evil. None whatsoever. They did not tolerate evil at all. They, and, and this is pointed out when, they, when he says, you um, have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. No tolerance for evil. Some people claimed to be speaking things that were true. And the church of Ephesus said, nope, that's not true. Sorry, this is true. Do you want to know how they knew what was true and what wasn't true? The word. The word of God. Do you want to know how you can know what's true and what isn't true? The word. The word of God. This is something that's surfacing a lot more in America, especially these days. We're seeing a lot of churches pop up. They're calling themselves churches. I, just for the sake of convenience, I'm going to call them churches. I don't officially recognize them as churches because they are not preaching truth. There are a lot of churches in America that preach non-truths, but they disguise it as truths because in the face of hardship, they caved. They would rather cave in on the truth than deal with the persecution that comes with the truth. Here's the deal. When you follow Jesus, when you follow Jesus and you believe what he says is true and you preach it yourself, there are going to be people who hate you for that. Congratulations, that's a sign that you're doing it right. When you start to cave and cater to the need and want of every single person, be it truthful or not, you have forfeited your spiritual integrity and you have settled for spiritual apathy. And that is dangerous. I don't think this church wrestles with that. I know Scott. I know how much he cares about Scripture and how much he cares about the authenticity, the inerrancy of Scripture. He deeply cares about it. Don't believe me? Talk to him. Call him. Text him. Ask him. He'll tell you. He loves talking about Scripture. He'll talk about Scripture all day long. It's like his favorite thing. And he loves it so much that he's willing to face that persecution of the world on your behalf. Right? He wants you to know that truth too. I want you to know that truth. And I'm sure many of you want the world to know this truth that God has prepared for us, even though it means we're going to face hardships. I'm not worried about this church in this area. I think you guys are doing a really good job. The next thing that they do well is they suffered for Christ's name. This kind of tags along with what I just said. They knew the cost of following Jesus, and yet they did so in the name of Jesus. They said, Jesus, we know what it's going to cost. We know the price to pay to follow you, to serve you. We're willing to pay it. We will follow you. We're committed to you. That's boldness. I think this church also has boldness. I think we're a committed church to following Jesus. I think we're committed 
to doing what we do in the name of Jesus. And lastly, they did not grow weary in the face of opposition. They didn't let the opposition that they were facing tear them down. I like to think of uh, my favorite example of opposition and the truth of God is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when they were threatened by an enormous flaming furnace and King Nebuchadnezzar said, all right, bow to these false idols or burn. And they were like, yeah, we'd rather burn. Sorry, Jesus can and will save us. We're not going to bow to your idols. And they knew the cost and they chose the furnace. They chose death over worshiping a false idol. That is boldness. So what about the church's errors? What about where they failed? It says in verse 4, it says this. I'm just going to read the Bible. I don't want to turn back and forth from my pages. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Verse 5, remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. Otherwise I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So the church in Ephesus had a lot of good things going for them. They had a lot of strong foundations. They were doing a lot of stuff right. But the fires in their hearts were starting to die out. The flame of passion for Christ was starting to get cool. Now they were still doing the right things. They were still doing the right things. But what had started as just sheer desire to serve the Lord had slowly turned into legalistic obligation. This is dangerous as well. And earlier I mentioned a phrase, spiritual apathy. We're going to come back to that. The actions were still there. And maybe on the surface, to someone looking in uh, from the outside, it didn't look like anything was wrong. But again, God knows our hearts. We know that for a fact. Remember when David was anointed to be king, God sees what's on the heart. But man doesn't see that. That roaring fire that was once made out of passion had started to turn into a wimpy little smolder. Falling out of love with Christ is incredibly dangerous because it will eventually lead to spiritual apathy. We talked about spiritual apathy a second ago and why it's bad and these people who are spiritually apathetic about their creator in the world. Why is spiritual apathy dangerous? Well, I'll tell you. Spiritual apathy is a gateway to falling in love with things other than God. More commonly, probably falling in love with the praise of man. Many of the churches we see today do this, right? They want to be liked by everybody, so they welcome all truths. Oh, just live your truth. Oh, just live your truth. Oh, you identify as a helicopter? That's fine. Live your truth. When you decide that everything is true, nothing is true. Having this firm foundation, yes, makes us a target, but it also gives us the real truth, capital T, truth, unwavering, unfailing, unchanging truth. When you fall out of love with Christ, you open the door for spiritual apathy, which then is a gateway to falling in love with something other than God. And loving something other than God means compromise with evil. You begin to allow sin to have authority in your life when you compromise with evil. And when you begin to allow sin to have authority in your life, this leads to corruption and then to death and then to judgment. This is a very dangerous spiral, but it starts with spiritual apathy. So, church, if you are sitting here this morning, whether it be in a chair, at home, watching on your phone or on your TV. Let me say this. You don't have to succumb to spiritual apathy. And I have a a trick for you. It's not really a trick. It's actually just a commandment that we've been given. 
spend time in the Word, but not out of obligation. Don't just check it off of your box every day. Oh, I read my Bible because I'm a Christian. Time to go to church because I'm a Christian. Time to go to this one event because I'm a Christian. No, no, no. That's not why we're doing this, right? Not the label. We do this because we want to love and be with our Father in heaven. I'm going to open my Bible and read it today because I want to see what God has for me today. And maybe he won't reveal anything spectacular, but I'm still going to read from it. I'm still going to spend time in his word. Why? Because I love my Father. I'm going to go to church today, not just because um, I want everyone to be impressed by my new fancy shoes. No, I want to go to church today so that I can spend time with my brothers and sisters and so that we together can worship our creator in community. I'm going to go to that event not because it's what Christians do. I'm going to go to that event because there are people out there who need food, who need shelter, who need clothes, and I can give it to them. I can help. So it's not necessarily the actions that are the issue. They were doing everything right. Their motives were starting to falter, and they were starting to just fall into spiritual apathy, just a moral, legal obligation, rather than a burning desire to serve their God. So here's my trick for you. If you find yourself in that situation, you want to worship Jesus every day, you want to do these things with a desire to serve God, then turn with me, if you will, to the book of Psalms. Or if you're on your phone, then click on the Bible app and then Psalms. We're going to be in Psalms. We're going to be in chapter 27. We're going to read one verse from chapter 27. It should be on the screen. Psalms 27, 4 says this. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. If you will make that your daily prayer, God will answer it. You want to know how I know? Because when I made that my daily prayer, God answered it. I asked God to fill my heart with desire for God. And the next morning when I woke up, the very first thought through my mind was, I want to be with my Lord Jesus today. I want to spend time in the Word today. And ever since then, I have prayed that prayer. God, help me desire you. And God says, absolutely. And the next morning I wake up with more desire. And then the next morning with more desire. And I'm not afraid of falling into spiritual apathy because God keeps answering that prayer. So I invite you, church, to make that, Psalm 27, 4, your daily prayer. Ask to just be with God. Spend time in his house. Make that your daily prayer. And God will fill your heart with desire for him. I heard something, um, the chaplain of, of the... Uh, of the chapel for Indiana Wesleyan when I was a student there. He said, do you want Jesus? And there was mixed responses from the student body. And he paused for a little bit and he says, okay, but do you want to want Jesus? And that got about a unanimous yes. So ask God to help you want to want God. He'll answer that. And your desire for him will grow and then you'll avoid the danger of the church of Ephesus, of falling into spiritual apathy. You'll have spiritual integrity. You'll have life, everlasting life, good life. I already think we've got a lot of what church Ephesus had going for them. I think we've got a lot of that down. I'm not too worried about this church in terms of what we do. I just want to make sure why we do it is square. And I can't be the judge of that. Scott can't be the judge of that. Only you and God have access to your heart. That's up to you. And so is it going to be a change that you make, or isn't it? That's the question. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for um, the green grass and the blue skies and this beautiful earth that you've created for us to live on and enjoy our lives. God, today I pray that you will instill in us a desire to serve you wholly and completely every single day of our lives. God, I pray right now that you will fill my heart with desire for you. I may not always feel 
like serving you, God. So I pray that when I don't feel like serving you, you will fill my heart with desire. Help the fiery passion for you never to die out. Don't let us fall into spiritual apathy, God. Keep us whole. Keep us afloat. Keep the fires ablaze. God, I thank you for this church and their hard work and their perseverance, for their attitudes towards you, for their intolerance of evil, God. I thank you for the integrity of this church body. You have blessed me with a community that treasures and values your word and your truth. So, God, we ask that you keep our hearts in line, too. We love you. We praise you. We ask all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.